Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning with thanks and joy, Heavenly Father, for all that has been done within our lives. Thanking you, Lord God, for this blessed morning. I pray, Father God, that you will give me the words that are needed to be delivered into your people, and I pray for the receptiveness of their hearts. And all these things I ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I bring you this morning hope and joy, and hope and joy can only be found within the Word of God. That is the only true source of hope and the only true source of joy. It is beyond expectations to tell you just how wonderful it is that you all came out so early this morning. I think some of us are rather fond of the early morning times. I, I vote to keep it, but we're not going to vote this morning. <laughs> I want to bring dissension within the church on the morning of Easter. It's so wonderful, though, that you were able to come out. You know, we are said that for us, Christ rose from the dead, but for Him, so many of us chose to stay in the bed. <laughs> but that's all right. You went against that. You all came this morning. We appreciate that. You know, I find sometime at this time of year that there's more expectation and more preparation given for a rabbit coming through your house and depositing eggs. I don't want either one to be found unexpectedly in my home, but either way, this is something that happens, and I've also never seen rabbits lay eggs. But you know what? I think we need to look, focus more of what we can upon the fact that our Lord and Savior came and gave us so much more than candy rabbits and golden eggs. I've said in messages through here before, I did a whole series on them, on the fact that all God has ever wanted since the time that He created man was for us to walk with Him. He has no other desire than to be with us, His creation, to be able to experience us, to have that relationship with us. That's all God has ever wanted. You know, He prepared the Garden of Eden, and He came down daily in the cool of the afternoon, we're told, to walk with Adam, to visit with him, to visit with Eve. But you know what? Adam chose to sin and thereby separated himself and also us from God. But you know what? God promised in his word that he would restore that relationship. He promises. He said, you know what? The first Adam messed up. But you know what? I'm going to bring you a second Adam. I'm going to send to you a son of God who is also a son of man. I'm going to send you a deliverer. I'm going to give you a Messiah. How much better is that than a basket full of fruits and vegetables or whatever we get for Easter? We're doing the Daniel plans. I'm hoping y'all had fruits and vegetables and not candy and um, chocolate bunnies in your basket. But that's all right. Today is a day of celebration. We're allowed fasting and feasting. Genesis 3.15, this is what God told to the serpent, to Satan. He said, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head. He shall crush your head, and you shall strike his heel. God, even speaking through his prophets, not only told them that I'm going to bring someone who's going to bring Satan down, but even told them a pretty good idea of, of where this Messiah would be born. A really good idea of when the Messiah would be born. He even gave them the lineage. He said, I tell you what, a Savior is going to come to you. He's going to be born of Abraham. He's going to be born of Jesse. He's going to be born of, the, of King David. This is the lineage. This is the family tree. This is how we get a pretty good idea where to find him. If you remember, he was born, what, in the house of bread, but it's also called the house of David because of his family. They knew where to find him. Signs were also given that would precede his birth. But you know what? When he came the first time, how many people were actually looking? They had read, you know, that a star would appear, a sign would appear. How many people were looking? If you read in the Word, well, specifically in the way the song goes, it says that there were three that came and found him. The song says there were three kings. Well, were the kings that came, were they Herod? Were they the king of Israel? No. Were they possibly Caesar, who was king and the ruler of all the world? No. There were three people that came from the outside. But you know what the difference was? They were looking. They were anticipating his arrival. You would continue in the Christmas story, and you see where the angels had to go out. The angels had to bring people to come celebrate his arrival. Who did they go get? Did they go get the kings? Did they go get the priests? No. They went and got the shepherds. 
A shepherd's main job is to do what? To watch. Simply to watch. They appeared to those who were watching and who were looking. He still does that today. Those who were awake through the night. Then we read that when he comes into the, the temple, that there were two people waiting there for him, at least two. You can imagine there were probably at that time about a million and a half Jews in Israel. Whenever he came to church that month, that's that particular morning, there were two waiting for him. We know him, Anna and Simeon. No an man and an old woman. But you know what? They were both holding on to a promise. As Jesus began to grow into a man, he began to teach, but he also began to feed. He fed thousands, we read about him. Two instances, once he fed 5,000, once he fed 4,000. Look at all the people that he healed. Look at all the people that he taught. But let me tell you, on the day that he crucified, he was hanging there on the cross. How many people were at his feet? Two. He looked down and he saw his mother, and he saw the apostle John. The apostle who he loved. Even during that time when he sat upon the cross, he looked up and God himself even turned his own back to him. Jesus hung there totally and completely alone. Remember, God could not look upon sin. You know, we taught a while back, you know, the fact that God is love. We understand that. God is love. But 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul tells us, For our sake, God made Christ to be sin. He who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Hanging on the cross, Christ became sin, and God cannot look upon sin. Christ that day took all our sins, past, present, and future, were bore by him. So we have Jesus hanging there all alone. We have him taken down, buried in a barred tomb, all alone. His followers did what? They all ran and they hid. On three separate occasions, Jesus told his followers exactly what was going to happen whenever they came into Jerusalem the week following Palm Sunday. His own believers, his own followers, they had even seen him raise people from the dead. They knew our resurrection power was. They had seen Lazarus. Lazarus was in the, in the tomb buried for four days. So if Lazarus can be dead for four days, surely could Jesus can come out in three. They had heard Jesus say in John 11:25, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Now, had Jesus' followers truly been listening and not just hearing, then they would know that when he would return and where he would return. Mark 8:31. Jesus plainly began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days he will arise. Matthew 14, 20. He told the disciples, For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And in Matthew 20, verses 17 through 19, Jesus specifically mentions the crucifixion. He tells his disciples, he says, look, we're going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And on the third day, he will be raised to life. Look. Some of these were simple men that he was talking to, but you know what? They could count to three. They knew where he was buried. It was not a secret. They knew the tomb in which he laid. They had seen everything occur exactly as he told them that the week would progress. But let me tell you this. As Jesus stepped out of that tomb in all of his glory, 
He stood there alone. There stood no one. This time it wasn't like in the garden when he began to look and call out, Adam! Adam! Where, where are you, Adam? Where are you? This time he didn't call for Adam. That time he walked in the garden alone with his heart broken by Adam's sin. This time when he walked out of the tomb, standing there, began to call him, Peter! Peter, the rock, the holder of truth. Peter, the very first one to call me Messiah. The one to proclaim that I am the Lord, the Son of God. Truly, Peter, you must be here. Surely, you're here somewhere, Peter. John? John. John, you're my beloved, my beloved apostle. John, you spent the last night, I was here, your head upon my chest. John, where are you? I told you what was going to happen. Three days I would rise. John, where are you? James, John, sons of Zebedee, just last week you were fighting over who would be on my right hand and who would be on my left hand. I see neither of you on my left or on my right. Matthew, Matthew, look, Matthew... You were a tax collector. You were despised by everyone. Everyone hated you. The Israelites hated you. The Romans hated you. Everyone hates you. I called you my brother. Surely you're here. Are none of my disciples here? You know what? Surely, surely my mother must be here. If no one else, if no one else will listen to me and follow me, surely my mother is here. Mary! Mary, wait, there's, wait. Finally, Mary is coming. Mary is coming to see. Mary is coming to see my blessed resurrection. But but what's she carrying? She's carrying oils. And she's carrying herbs to anoint the dead. Even Mary doesn't come to expect and receive a risen Savior. Has no one heard anything that I've said in all this time? No one's willing to believe that what I said was true. No one is willing to accept that I died, but yet I am resurrected and I live. When Mary got to the tomb, the angels asked her a question. They said, whom do you seek? And I never really noticed that in the past, because we know they know what she was seeking. But I'll tell you what, if you come to my house and... You know, you're coming, you're bearing a, a black wreath and bearing all these things. And, and I said, you know, it's my birthday. Well, who are you looking for? You must be at the wrong house. The angels asked Mary, who do you seek? She obviously did not expect to see the risen Savior that stood before. This morning, I ask each one of you the exact same question. Who do you seek? Thank God you rose up early this morning and you came to this church. Who did you come seeking? There's a song that I absolutely love to sing. And it says, Lord, I find you in the seeking. I'm going to tell you this morning, you find the Savior that you seek. Who do you seek this morning? If you seek a Jesus who was a good teacher, a good man, led a wonderful life, then you know what? That's the only Jesus you're going to find. If you came seeking a Jesus who gave his life for our sins, died for us, suffered for us, was buried, went to hell for us, and was then resurrected on the third day, then I can promise you that is the Jesus that you will find. Twice in the past, if you read your Bible, God told us of his soon appearing, and we weren't ready. First, at his birth, he told them where he would be born, when he would be born, and one was ready. At his resurrection, his return, 
He told them when it would happen, where it would happen. No one was ready. I've got to tell you today, it's my job as as the pastor of this church and the preacher in this pulpit to tell you that Jesus is coming again. There is another time. He is coming yet again. And I have to ask you the same question we would have asked of all of them. Will you be ready? John chapter 14, Jesus gave us these words of comfort and instruction. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go prepare a place for you? If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. And where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Because I live, you also will live. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you, not peace as the world sees it. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let them be afraid. When Jesus stood among the disciples after his resurrection, as he ascended the last time into heaven, Christ instructed us to watch again for his return. Acts chapter 1, verse 7 through 11. Jesus said to them, It is not for you to know the time or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. And suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into heaven? The same Jesus who has been taken away from you will come back in the same way you have seen him go. We are simply told throughout all of Scripture that Christ's return is soon. We're also though instructed to pray every day, even so, Come quickly, Lord Jesus. The last words of Jesus recorded in the Bible are found in Revelations chapter 20. He says unto them, Behold, I am coming soon. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come. Let the one who is thirsty, Come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price come. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. This morning, Jesus himself steps out upon the portals of heaven. And you know what? He's calling your name. Every one of your names he is calling out this morning. As he looks over heaven, he's calling out your name. And he wants to know one thing. Are you looking for my return? Are you ready for my return? Are you anticipating my return? Do you even want me to return? You do realize that whenever Peter heard that Christ had risen, Peter may not have been as excited about it as we were. Peter knew the last time when he had seen Christ that he had betrayed him. Peter may not have been so happy for Christ's return. There are many today who are not so happy for the idea that Christ is returning. Have you accepted Christ as your risen King? Have you accepted Him as the Lord of your life? Have you repented of your sin and asked Him to build His kingdom, not on earth this time, not in a garden, not in a manger, not even in a tomb, but have you asked Him to build His kingdom within your heart? I've often said that God, who is all-knowing, is never surprised. But you know what? I think God is often disappointed. 
Disappointed is when he comes and no one is waiting. Do you know what? When I came out this morning and we changed the service to 7 o'clock, and I know I'm not the only one, we come in the doors this morning, there were three of us, four of us. Okay, we're waiting, we're waiting. You know what? And yet people come to experience their Savior. Like I said, God's never surprised when he's often disappointed. But you know what? I believe God is also joyful, I read. And you know what? Joy only comes upon a surprise. The greatest joy is when I look down at my phone and I see that my child is calling me. I get a call from Wyoming. Sometimes I'm like, oh, what's wrong? Hey, Dad just called just to say hey. I get a postcard from my child. The joy, not expected. I get a smile from my child, unexpected. From an 18-year-old, I get a smile at me at breakfast in the morning. Can you imagine that? When I say good morning and she says, good morning. That's what God wants. That's the joy that God receives is by us surprising Him. The French say on this morning, my French is horrible, but what they say is basically says, the love of God is foolish. Because that's what we're told in scriptures, and to a mortal man it's foolish, the way God loves us. The fact that God gave His perfect Son to save a son full of sin, to save us, to save sons and daughters of sin, that's foolishness. But you know what? When we accept that, in return, God gives us joy. Can you imagine whenever your child comes to you and they say, I love you? You didn't even have to say it first. Can you imagine when your child crawls up in your lap and just gives you a big hug and a kiss on the neck? You know what? God expects and wants that from us as well. So you know what I want? As God is calling out your name this morning, I'm asking you to call out to Jesus. What better be, what did better possible day could there be to experience life in Him if you never have? If you never accepted Christ, what better day can it be than today, the day of His resurrection? Or maybe you have. Maybe you've been a Christian for your whole life. Well, then what better day to be resurrected in a newness of life very soon the altars are going to be open. And you know what? When they open the altars this morning, I'm going to be right here. And if you want somebody to stand and pray with you, I'd be glad to pray with you. We don't assume that everyone that comes to the altars knows how to pray. You know what? We're here to help you. We're here to show love. Today's the day we celebrate the love of Christ and all that He's given unto us. Show that love to your fellow people this morning. Be sure not to leave this place without loving them. But this is the opportunity for you to come into Christ this morning, to experience the Savior and the fullness of His glory. Most Heavenly Father, I thank You, Lord God, that You've given us this opportunity. Let us, Lord God, now take this opportunity to be reminded unto You and to Your glorious resurrection. Father God, let us even now accept You into our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, yeah.